in a county commission meeting. Oh, you- <laughs> as long as you're not worried about catching a pass or making a touchdown, I think you're okay. okay. <laughs> I don't want you to jinx us. So. I know. I, I've been doing this for too long, Commissioner. If the jinx, the jinx is, uh, you know, <laughs> I think it, we would have known a long time ago. Good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> Sorry, on TV okay, this my clock says nine o'clock. Let's go. Is it time to start? Yes, right. sir. Good. Good morning. Welcome to the Shawnee County Board of County Commissioners. My name is Kevin Cook. I currently serve as the chair of the Shawnee County Commission representing District 2. Joining me today is Commissioner Bill Ripron representing District 1 and Commissioner Aaron Mays representing District 3. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good. Uh, We are conducting this meeting in a virtual format due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We hope to be able to return back to a normal setting as quickly as possible. And uh, if while you are on watching, if you could please mute your microphone so that we could not have any feedback or other noises. This is being recorded and broadcast. That would be appreciated. And uh, our first item is to take the Pledge of Allegiance. And so if you would please mute your microphones, I'll recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Ms. Beck, our first item. Okay, the item one, proclamations, presentations, uh, family park master plan presentation, Tim Laurent, Parks and Recreation Director, and uh, Zach Sneathan, HTK Architects. Good morning, Commissioners, Tim Laurent, uh, Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, This morning, we did want to come before you and give you an update on the progress of our uh, family park master plan. I have Zach Sneathan and Brian Sturm here with me. Uh, from HTK Architects and Landwork Studios, respectively. And I'd like to turn it over to them to begin with. They'll go through the presentation and then we'd be happy to answer any questions uh, or concerns that you have. Uh, We are not expecting any action today. Uh, With that, I'll turn it over to Zach. Okay, can you all hear me? I think I've uh, shared my screen. Um, I don't have any video up, but um... If uh, Stephanie, if you're able to turn my video on, you can have it up. Yes, Zach, we can hear you and we can see the uh, first screen for Family Park. Okay, sounds good. I will go ahead and get started. And as Tim mentioned, um, also uh, here with me is uh, Brian Sturm from Landworks Studio, um, HTK Landworks, um, and Cook Flat and Strobel are the the, the design team uh, that's working on this master plan. Um, Today, as we've, we've worked through this and we've been before the commission a couple times, um, this is kind of a, a uh, we wanna first recap kind of where we've been um, and then start to unveil the, the plans that we've put uh, forth for uh, the family park. And um, I think as I start off, there we go. As we start off, just look back on kind of who all has been a part of um, this planning process, who all we've sought input from uh, during this process. And it's really uh, working with uh, uh, directly with Tim and his staff um, at Parks and Rec um, to, to really uh, to go out to the public, seek feedback, um, and then really start to craft these plans that, that um, you, you'll see here today. Um, just to step back a little bit, um, some of these slides that you'll see are ones that, that we've seen um, in the past, but it's really looking at kind of the, the, that culmination of uh, this planning process. And what are, were the, some of those objectives that we um, set out initially to, um, uh, for, the, for the development of this master plan? And it was really um, when we, we um, met back in July and we talked about um, a process to seek community input Um, and understanding what people wanted to see, what um, people would like to see out at this park. Um, uh, Working through a process um, over the last six months of uh, seeking community input and then taking that input um, and then developing different scenarios and different options of what might 
what some of these amenities might be um, in this park. And then taking those options, um, those ideas back out to the community and seeking feedback on those um, to ultimately then uh, from that, that second round of feedback, then really hone in on um, kind of refining those options and um, working towards a, uh, the plan that you'll see today. Um, and as we continue forward with this is continuing to uh, develop that plan for implementation. So the ultimate goal that we all wanna see is that new uh, destination park in, in Shawnee County out here. And so just to kind of, again, step back and look at where we've been through this process, um, we kicked off this, um, this process back in uh, late July, actually, um, with, a, with a community survey, uh, was at the county commission meeting um, and kicked off that community survey that was really that initial survey um, that, that went out to the public um, to uh, seek input on what people would like to see. Um, within that time period, we also had, um, we met with the advisory board and we started to um, uh, uh, have conversations with them as along the same lines of the survey as what would you as advisory board members like to see at this park. Um, during this process early on, we talked about how can we reach out and get out in the public um, in a manner that's safe given uh, the conditions we were in. Um, and, but it still kind of come alongside those online surveys with some public interaction. Um, and we we're able to do that um, several times throughout the process of having uh, pop-up events uh, throughout the community um, at different parks in, in the uh, in the Parks and Recs network of um, having the information generally following along with the surveys, general, the same information that's out in the surveys, um, but have a chance opportunity for people to uh, look at posters, look at boards, uh, look at information, um, take, a, take a flyer that they can then go home and, and fill out the survey on. Um, and so we did that. <laughs> We did, we did that early on in the process and really at each step of that, that community feedback, um, we, uh, we went out with a similar process of, of uh, getting, getting the public informed or inf uh, about the, the planning process. Um, in September, um, after the, that first round of survey information came back, we held a, a design charrette with Parks and Rec staff, an all day design charrette. Um, where we developed uh, out of that, we developed three different concepts, uh, reviewed those with Parks and Rec staff, talked about the pros and cons of each of those, um, and then uh, used those concepts to go back out in October with a community uh, uh, survey or feedback survey to really share the, start to share those concepts, um, ask what people liked, what they didn't like, what they felt was missing um, in the parks, um, and did a couple pop-up events with that as well out at Betta Sports Park at the end of October, and then another pop-up at uh, Gage Park when Boo at the Zoo was going on um, uh, in October. Um, and from that, from that process, uh, took that information that we heard um, and started to refine those concepts um, and develop um, what the, uh, the components, the amenities uh, of this park um, might look like. And as we, we develop those, we start to look at um, kind of the, the different, uh, the, or start to develop the budget alongside with, along, along with that, as well as um, implementation strategies. Um, that really kind of brings us to where we're at today. Um, Earlier, last week, we presented with the advisory board, um, the Shawnee County Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Um, the master plan and today uh, we're here uh, at the county commission meeting presenting this officially presenting this um, to the commission and and to the public um, i think brian you're here as well um, brian's going to kind of step us through some of the the uh, community engagement um, processes and um, some of the things that we heard from that and talk about how that shaped um, these plans that we have today yeah, thank you, Zag. Good morning, commissioners. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great, great. <clears throat> well, we appreciate your time this morning. Um, Zag's done a great job leading us in here. You know, the, the project was one that 
uh, was kind of conceived before the pandemic. Um, but fortunately, we had, uh, you know, already kind of planned to have a pretty diversified public engagement strategy for this project, knowing that, you know, it was almost as important for us to really garner feedback from the public as it was for us to, you know, put together a, you know, a, just, just a, a design. So we started out our process with a digital outreach effort in the first place. We sent out a survey really trying to gauge what the greater you know, Shawnee County public wanted to see in this park. What, what elements, what type of amenities, um, what type of programming opportunities would be most desired. Um, and this pie chart here on the left side of this page it illustrates some of the feedback we got. We, we gave folks a whole lot of choices and they, they gave us back a lot of answers. What we kind of noticed in this survey as well as subsequent surveys that the items that rose to the top were, were some of the most you know, simple and, and basic desires you usually see uh, communities ask for in a park. Certainly things like restrooms and shelters, places to, to gather for picnics. But people were really looking for, in a lot of ways, you know, simple uh, almost back to nature kind of amenities. You, you see on this chart things like natural wilderness area, um, gardens, uh, ponds, you know, a, a sledding hill. And some of the top responses were, were really simple, passive recreation type amenities uh, that we were starting to see folks wanted to see in this park. Um, you know, we followed up that initial survey, which you know, was about a three week time period. We got over 1500 responses. We followed that up with some more focused um, outreach to some, some kind of key stakeholders, uh, groups of folks that we already knew when we stepped into this project were well aware of this park, well aware of the planning effort that had been going on and had some special interest in this piece of property. So we reached out and we spoke with um, folks associated with the golfing community, certainly Shawnee Park and Recreation staff at, at Cypress Ridge, uh, folks in the community who have a real passion for uh, for getting bringing ice to Topeka uh, for hockey as well as figure skating, uh, folks in the in the sort of off road cyclist community, folks who have a desire for for either mountain bike amenities or BMX amenities, um, the pickleball community, um, as well as folks who have in the horseshoe community, folks who've been looking to to find more opportunities for 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 that uh, program as well. Um, and we got a lot of great feedback from those. Uh, you know, folks were able to give us some specifics for what they would like to see, what would work for them in, um, in the development of this park. Those two survey efforts, um, you know, informed, um, uh, you know, a great deal of, of what we started to put onto our preliminary designs. But before we, before we got to that, um, we had we had an initial meeting with the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. I know Zach was, was present for that effort. Yeah, and that um, at that time we also talked about when we we we've talked about this being a destination park, and we um, asked people what does it mean to be a destination, and what are some of those amenities that that you might consider um, uh, being such to call this a destination park. And we talked the talking with the advisory board. We talked a lot about kind of what is that something that's that's very unique to this park, something that's maybe not found in in other parks um, in the community um, or maybe even in the region, but so that we can start to create this park as a destination um, for residents, but also for uh, the greater kind of Northeast Kansas region. Um, along those lines, you really need to be able to cater to um, people of all ages, all abilities, um, making sure that the park has, just as the other um, kind of major destination parks in Shawnee County have, is, is, a, is a wide range of amenities um, so that you you capture people that are that are interested in just being out in nature, or p capture people that are that are interested to go to an event there. But um, really looking at some of those those components that that really start to make this um, more than just a neighborhood park, but to to create this. Um, uh, as, a, as a true destination park. Some of the amenities that we talked about early with the, or that we heard from the advisory board, some of those initial meetings is, um, is what kinds of interactive play um, uh, or having something that's, that's interactive um, 
from a play standpoint, different types of trails, developing a trail system through here so that um, you can just go out and hike and be in, in nature. Um, again, that notion of uh, components and amenities that are available for all ages and all abilities. Um, there was interest in people brought up ideas of a family obstacle course. Um, we heard about ice skating rink. We heard about hiking and biking trails. Um, again, and then just um, picnic areas, those places to go out, be with your family, be with your friends um, out in nature. Um, and and so those those along with that information along with the the um, the surveys has really started to help shape um, shape some of the components that that went into this park. Yeah, what we what we really started to you know learn from from all of our our discussions with with the public as well as you know appointed officials on the advisory board was. Uh, you know, folks wanted to see a lot of different passive recreation opportunities out here, whether it was, um, you know, hiking on trails is probably the most popular option, um, you know, or, or being able to um, really just enjoy, enjoy something a little bit more rugged um, and more natural. Um, we still saw plenty of you know, support for very specific sports interests, uh, whether that was, um, you know, off-road bike amenities that there was desire for, whether that was, whether that was, a, you know, an indoor ice uh, facility, whether that was pickleball or golf. Um, but overall, folks were looking for, you know, a place that they could go to and, and, and kind of revert to nature, uh, you know, gather with family, uh, have, you know, a multi-generational experience. And, and so in line with that, you know, accessibility was a, was a key factor we were able to deduce. And that's something that, uh, you know, bears out in our designs, trying to create a park that, that will, will truly be accessible to, to all those who want to come and enjoy. Um, you know, special input as the process went on from, from staff uh, was key, um, particularly with regard to uh, you know, the needs of the Cypress Ridge Golf Course. Uh, that's this park's largest neighbor. You know, the, the, the whole southern boundary, uh, you know, sort of joins with the Cypress Ridge Golf Course. It's really all one property. And as we looked at the state of that golf course, we started to recognize that there were opportunities with the family park property um, that would allow us to address certain needs that Cypress Ridge has and that Cypress Ridge will certainly have as we move into the next, you know, 10 to, to 15 years. Um, and we, 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 in, in that vein, we've tried to create a plan uh, that, that can be phased, uh, the development for which can be phased over a period of time, whether that's two or, or three phases. Um, you know, that's going to be important to how this park develops with a, you know, roughly 80 acre almost piece of property. You're, you're not going to do that all at one time. We've tried to create a master plan that is sort of broken into multiple nodes of activity uh, and that can be phased in a, in a relatively clean manner. Um, the slide mentions here, you know, the design team as, as we looked further and, and dug deeper into the nature of this landscape, uh, what it offered. There were a lot of desire for water-based amenities. Um, we determined that, you know, creating a, a brand new, you know, large pond of some size on this property was probably not feasible. Um, while the topography might allow for something like that to be constructed, um, you know, understanding the water that's coming from upstream and that currently today passes through the site and feeds uh, the water hazards of the lakes and the Cypress Ridge Golf Course um, is, you know, is, is a, it's something that will demand study. But at first glance, uh, our, our concern would be that, you know, retaining water on this site, creating a large pond of some sort on this side would, would likely rob uh, the golf course of, of the water it sort of relies on for those features. Um, you know, as we say here at the bottom of this slide, you know, there's a lot of room on this property. There are a lot of desires. There's, there's a lot of ways to fit uh, what people want to see onto this plan, but you're not going to get everything. That, that's, and that's usually the case. Yeah, early on in our design process, we 
took our opportunities uh, sort of in late summer to uh, get a, a real good site inventory of this property. That map on the upper left-hand corner of this slide illustrates a real quick takeaway of, of those efforts. Our team pretty much tromped through and, and bushwhacked across, you know, every stretch of, of, of this piece of land. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of three different zones. You have, you have the east side of this park that is, that is largely maintained and, and mowed. Um, you know, you have the aquatic center that's been developed and been really successful and, and what most people think of when they think of this site in the northeast corner. You have a large meadow of, of you know, mown turf south of that. And really, as you get further south, you get into an area that's already kind of maintained by the golf course, has been for years and years sort of used as a, as a sod farm. It's all you know, zoysia grass down there. You can tell it's, it's, it's more or less used periodically for golf course repair. The, uh, the far western section of the site is relatively open, not necessarily mowed, but um, you know, mowed on a, a more seasonal basis, looks more like kind of a prairie today. Um, that's, that portion of the site features uh, the golf course maintenance shed where that's been for, for decades. Um, all the equipment is stored there. Staff goes in and out of that location down to the golf course, you know, throughout the day, a uh, small tree nursery up there. Uh, there's, you know, old golf course uh, you know, pavement that's kind of stockpiled in various places through there. The central portion of the property is really the most rugged and undeveloped, although all this property was likely farmed, you know, within the past 50 years. That area in the middle is, you know, really marked by two different streams that uh, cross underneath 21st Street, converge somewhere in sort of the middle of the site, and then continue to meander on down to the golf course. Uh, the topography through there is, is somewhat steep. Um, there's a lot of uh, old farm field kind of growth through there, cedar trees, pear trees. It's, it's pretty thick with vegetation. Um, not necessarily, you know, picturesque and beautiful like uh, Wilson Lake State Park or, you know, or Canopolis State Park, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's moving in that direction. It's, it's a piece of land that's, that's kind of reverting back to nature. Um, certainly our neighbor to the south you know, being the golf course, our, our neighbors to, to the west being kind of undeveloped uh, property uh, on the north and then residential on the south. Um, you know, those, those are all significant uh, factors in how this, how this land develops. On the bottom, you see uh, three concepts that came out of our day-long charrette with county staff. Uh, we spent, uh, so the whole design team spent the day with a, a good chunk of, of Parks and Rec staff and developed, you know, three alternative concepts for this plan that were informed by our discussions with staff and our, our initial survey with, with the county. We took those concepts, uh, refined them a little bit, uh, you know, gave them labels, uh, you know, put them onto, onto, you know, a title block. And then we put those three concepts out to the public for another uh, digital survey that lasted uh, for about three weeks. Uh, we also had a couple of pop-up meetings with those concepts, went out to the public, asked folks what they thought, what kind of questions they had. We were looking to see if folks maybe had a favorite concept among the three, but really more important to us was finding out which amenities on these plans you know, generated the most excitement, maybe which amenities on these plans uh, was, was superfluous or maybe obsolete. Um, you know, which of these concepts, you know, really piqued folks' interest. We spent some time following up that survey, uh, you know, kind of taking the, 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 the concept that maybe generated the most buzz, but, but, you know, moving amenities around, starting to think about how we could phase this park. Those bottom three drawings were sketches that were generated in, in meetings with staff during November with the goal being uh, the ability to, to finally come, you know, bring all these ideas into one cohesive master plan um, that you're getting to see here now. I'd say that, I mentioned this before, this master plan can kind of be thought of in sort of four to five, you know, large nodes of activity. The uh, you know one distinguishing feature that that runs all the way through the park is is this sort of uh, parkway. This is 
internal park road that, that would provide connection from Urish all the way back to the Northwest to 21st Street. Uh, that was a feature that was put onto one or two of the concepts. Uh, folks tended to have a, you know, a good response to that. I'll say that we ultimately put this in here for, for sort of two main reasons. One was just to, you know, at full build out, be able to provide folks with access to the, you know, sort of the whole acreage of the park. Uh, and the other reason being, as we get into this, there are a couple of, you know, nodes of development here that'll have a good bit of activity, some high activity at different periods of time. And we felt that being able to provide full access um, in, at those times when this park was really busy uh, would be important just from a safety and traffic flow and emergency management standpoint. Uh, to kind of dissect the plan, maybe we'll start in the Northeast. Um, that's the area that folks are already coming to today when they come to visit this park. They're coming to Midwest uh, Health Aquatic Center. Uh, that, that aquatic center features a, a very generously sized parking lot. We'd love to be able to take advantage of some of that parking that already exists. And so we coupled some of the more active and kind of intense pieces of, of recreational development in this park right there. Um, the, uh, we, one of the elements in this park we knew from the get-go that was demanded was destination play. Uh, the cursor's kind of hovering over that area right now. That's a, around an acre-sized playground. There'd be, uh, you know, play equipment there that would, that would cater to folks of all ages, uh, certainly younger children ages, say two to five, as well as older kids, more, you know, ages five to 12. Um, there'd be a picnic shelter and restroom to, to you know, service folks right there. Um, this uh, central feature right here, this elliptical feature, we call this the Great Lawn. This is really nothing more than a nice, you know, broad open moans piece of turf. Um, great place to, you know, set out a, a blanket, have a picnic, great place to throw Frisbees to your dog. Um, also a great place a few times a year to have, you know, gatherings. It could be a venue for, for festivals. Uh, you know, there's access for folks to be able to bring food trucks to the South or set up a stage. Uh, for a music event. That's what that space is all about. It's kind of like a large gathering space and brings all these uses together. On the Far East, uh, we develop a 16 court pickleball facility. Uh, this, these courts would be afforded with shade structures, uh, benches, spaces for folks to be able to sit as they prepare to play. Um, we've also planned for a uh, shelter and restroom building to, you know, to, to service that so that there's multiple places for people to, you know, picnic and gather underneath roofs. The cursor right is, is also hovering over another feature we got a lot of great response for in our surveys. That's an adult fitness place. Sometimes we call these fitness playgrounds, um, really an outdoor, um, you know, almost gym space, a uh, place to put fitness equipment uh, for folks who want to be able to come out here and you know, exercise, whether they're, whether they got kids uh, over on the other playground, whether they're waiting for a pickleball game, this is a place where people can come and, and be active. Um, so that's really the, the Northeast section right there on the South side of our park road, still here on the Urish, um, you know, side of the park, we have um, some golf development. What we're looking to be able to provide here in the Southeast corner is a, a new golf clubhouse and, and kind of community uh, venue, uh, activity center of sorts, uh, a building that would not only serve as the Cypress Ridge um, clubhouse and pro shop, there'd be space for cart storage as well, um, but also space that would have community meeting rooms um, and, and spaces for community events. Um, we see the parking lot there that would, that would, that would service, you know, that, uh, that facility. We've also planned space for a new driving range. It's typical that if you're going to have a golf clubhouse that you have that driving range nearby, this would afford folks, a, you know, good, um, you know, 300 yards of space there to, to tee off um, as they prepare to, to hit the course. Um, all of that we've, we've placed appropriately right up against the golf course. There'd be a, a bit of restructuring of holes to make this work, um, but nothing too crazy. It's stuff we've, we've spent a good bit of time speaking about with uh, the Cypress Ridge staff. Um, up here in the Northwest, um, we have uh, an indoor activity center. Uh, this is a building that's been sized to provide indoor space uh, for any of those larger 
um, you know, sport activities that occasionally want to be indoors, whether that's, you know, providing a turf field for soccer, whether that's providing, uh, you know, an ice rink for, for hockey or figure skating. Um, that's what this building is designed to support, as well as the parking around it. We wanted to place this, um, you know, kind of on the opposite end of the, of the course from, from say, a, a golf and, and community clubhouse. Uh, they're kind of, you know, bookending this park in terms of, you know, large gathering spaces um, and really features that, that, you know, grace those entryways and, and kind of welcome folks into the park. Um, on the other side of that entry road up there in the Northwest, um, we have, you know, slightly less intense, a little bit more passive, you know, activity options. We've, we've planned space for a nearly uh, three acre dog park. Um, a dog park that would, you know, afford separate zones for, for owners of small dogs, owners of large dogs, um, even a, you know, a third sort of flex space uh, for when you want to be able to rotate those uses and repair turf. Uh, we have a, a, a second playground on that side of the park. This is a playground that would be really more devoted to nature play. Um, it would feature equipment that is, you know, of kind of natural materials, stone, wood, something more tied into the natural landscape that dominates the central part of this park. Um, there'd be another restroom and shelter there for folks using that as well as the dog park. Um, we even found space for some horseshoe pits in that, in that portion of the park. Um, with the goal of having those elements that I've just described kind of tie into the natural uh, core of the park. Um, the sort of last note of, of activity is there on the central western side. That's an area we've kind of developed for bike uses. Um, we've, we've found space there for a kid's bike playground, a uh, space that, you know, younger riders, folks who are still getting used to being on two wheels can go and, and ride through obstacles and, you know, be in a, a safe environment where they can, where they can really just, you know, work on their riding and enjoy being on a bike. Um, to the west of that, there to the left, is a space we devoted to um, a pump track. A pump track's amenity that's, that's not really currently found in, in Topeka and still really uncommon in the greater KC metro area. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that's a series of ramps and, and moguls interspersed with, with, with sort of grass and, and permeable space. It's a, a space designed for riders of you know, BMX style bikes to be able to just go up and down over these, you know, smooth moguls, develop speed by kind of the pumping action of their arms on their handlebars as they go up and down. Um, that space takes up a little less than an acre of space over there, um, could really blend into the natural uh, landscape surrounding it. Really, we want to keep a lot of that western um, portion of the park, especially the southwestern area, kind of open and, and, and have more of a prairie feel. You know, the, the interstitial space um, throughout this park and kind of the, the element that glues it all together is this trail network. Um, we've been able to craft, you know, more than a, a mile of, of trail passing through this park from one side to the other. Uh, it would take the form of both paved, concrete, uh, you know, shared use paths pathways that are completely accessible to folks, whether you're, you know, pushing a stroller, you're on a bike, you're on a walker. Um, we want to be able to provide folks a way to circumvent this park if they wish on an accessible pathway. Through the really interior portions of the park, we've also envisioned that there'd be softer, uh, you know, slightly narrower paths, maybe six to eight feet uh, constructed of, you know, crushed stone. Um, something that's a little bit lighter on the land in those areas where we don't want to make, you know, have to disturb the landscape quite as much during construction. These are some of the images really once you get down on the ground. The, the plan we've been looking at is, is a model we've developed developed and we've sort of been staring at it like we're, um, you know, migrating birds uh, a couple hundred feet up. Once you get close to the ground, these are some of the spaces we've, we've tried to add a little bit of detail to. This would be that destination playground that we've worked to develop on the east side of the park, just, uh, you know, on the south side of the aquatic center's parking lot. Um, these are just examples of the types of structures that um, you, you, you see these days in, in, in what we call destination playgrounds. For a, a regional park like this, it's going to have, you know, a draw for all of Shawnee County and beyond. Uh, we want to be able to provide something exciting, something that's, that's not found in, in other parks. Um, folks in the community did express a desire that these playground features kind of be inspired by um, nature, inspired by the environment. 
Um, we look to source playground equipment that is, um, you know, modern, um, you know, uh, using, using, using natural materials, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of metal, a lot of cable, but I'll stress that however this destination playground would come together, you know, in a future design phase, it'd be a collaborative effort between, uh, you know, the designers, probably con contractors, suppliers, and, and the county um, to come up with something that's, you know, that's easily maintainable and, and, and fits within the budget for this plan. You see also in that image, uh, an example of the picnic shelter and, and restroom facilities that we uh, envision for this space. Uh, those are going to be big revenue generators, I, you know, this, the, the picnic spaces in this park are going to be busy um, really year round. Uh, and it's something that, that we know is important for this park. Here's an image of that other, that sort of secondary playground on the west side of the master plan. We call this the natural playground. Like I said, we'd be focusing on equipment here that is, um, you know, more tied to the landscape. We see, you know, climbing boulders, um, you know, and, and, and cable play here. Uh, play structures that are, you know, fabricated of, of, of real wood, uh, provide kids a, a chance to, you know, really connect to the materials and to the natural environment that's out there. Uh, we see another shelter just, you know, to the north of this playground, places for folks to, to, to picnic and gather for parties. Off in the background, you see the indoor activity center that, that's, that we've planned for the northwest corner of the park, uh, the parking around that. Um, and then as well, just the south of that, the bike amenity space, both the children's bike playground, sort of in the closer background, and then that pump track a little further uh, to the west. Here's a view of the park from its southeastern corner. We're sort of hovering over that new golf clubhouse and the parking that would serve that. Again, the idea with this clubhouse, it's it's, it's more than just something for, for, for the Cypress Ridge course and, and those that would be golfing there. We want this to be really a community amenity, a place where we can hold, you know, where the community can have meetings and, 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 other, and be a venue for, you know, receptions and events such as that. The driving range is there just to the background, as well as other activities. Uh, this is a scene from, um, from yeah, the Overlook Mound. This is a feature that we have planned in the southwestern corner, um, want, trying to create a, a, a sort of a hilltop. There's already a bit of an existing hilltop down there. Certainly the earthwork associated with this park would generate uh, more. Being able to build up this space that's, say, 20 feet higher than the rest of the surrounding grade so that folks can get up there and really have an outlook uh, and, and prospect over all the acreage of the park. And that's what this image is from. And here's an image of that bicycle pump track. Again, the space that's designed for, for, for bikers who want to be able to get out and, um, you know, just choose their own path, um, you know, roll up and down these, these sort of gentle hills and, and, and build up some speed. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a many we're seeing more and more uh, across the Midwest. It's really taking hold in America um, and something that we heard from citizens would be desired out here on, on this property. I think this one last view, this is back on the east side. This is uh, looking towards the southwest, looking over that great lawn space that we described, that sort of open turf meadow, place for community events, festivals, a place just to relax and, and you know, and enjoy some sun. Um, a little closer in the foreground is the uh, adult fitness space, that fitness playground. These are examples of some of the um, you know, equipment that you'd see out there. It's an opportunity for the, the department to do some fitness programming. It's also just an opportunity to create more space for people to be able to exercise outdoors. And I think we've all learned over the last um, year just how, how valuable it is to have outdoor amenities um, year round. And that circles us back around to kind of that overall view of um, of the entire park. And as we mentioned, um, uh, kind of, and as we heard from the advisory board, kind of that recognition of kind of these three distinct areas um, within the park, almost three parks within one, but really trying to, to spread that, that activity and those interests out um, so that, that we're taking full advantage of the, not only the natural amenities, but, but the space available that's out here in this 60 plus acres of parkland. 
So Tim, maybe turn it back yeah. over to you and then we can sure. be happy to answer any questions that people have. Well, I know that was a lengthy presentation, commissioners, and I appreciate uh, everyone uh, giving us this time to go through the plan and be happy to answer any questions that you might have at this point. Commissioner Mays, any questions? Yeah, I've got a few. Um, so you showed us the overlook mound. Um, is, and, and I realize the dirt work is relatively inexpensive when compared to a lot of the other things that are in here. Um, it's kind of back in the, uh, I would say kind of the far corner of the park. Um, if that road doesn't get built, I would assume that access would be rather limited. Um, and, and even if it does, it seems like the parking for that might be quite a walk up there. Um, is that something that could be sort of accomplished with the sledding hill, um, which would be right up next to the existing parking lot um, now? Or, I mean, is that something that was considered? Because yeah. it seems to me that even in the summertime, the sledding hill, kids are probably going to be climbing on it. I, I know when I was a kid, I probably would have been. So, um, right. No, I, th I think, uh, Commissioner Mays, I, 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 as Zach mentioned earlier, I think as if, as we go through this process, I would see the, um, the mound as a later phase simply because, uh, as Zach mentioned, you, you, as we go through the process of building other amenities, there'll be dirt work and there'll be excavation and there'll, there'll be a need to put dirt somewhere. Um, and I think the mound provides that. Uh, and there's already uh, a uh, grade for the sledding hill, but we did discuss here very recently trying to expand the size of the sledding hill the actual width of it so that more people could could use it because we do think it would be, especially in the winter, it'll be a, a popular amenity. And so there may be a chance to reconfigure some of the items that we see on the plan to actually expand the size of the sledding hill. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, also, I had a question, the fitness playground, is, is that geared more towards adults or kids or, or you know, what's the, the target audience with something like that? It is definitely geared more towards adults. Um, uh, yes. I think within, okay. with, even within the, the play areas themselves, though, the equipment there would be more geared towards adults, but there are other um, kind of components, whether they're um, little mounds or kind of uh, jumping blocks, things like that, 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 that younger, um, I don't know that you're going to have necessarily toddler, want toddlers running around on it, but that you could have younger kids um, engaged in it, as well as I think the, the natural playground areas may also um, incorporate some of those similar fitness amenities, but maybe in a, maybe a more natural setting that might be uh, more conducive to say a, a six, seven, eight year old or so um, climbing up on some rocks or um, mm -hmm. uh, walking up a hill or so. Um, yeah, I'll say I, committee is, you know, two things. One, that adult fitness, the, the, the fitness area would be geared more towards adults. And, and we've, we've kind of tried to space it closer to pickleball courts than the destination play. So that's, that, that's kind of thought as slightly, you know, more of an adult area. But I'll also say that, you know, there's a big trend in, in play and fit equipment these days where manufacturers are trying to make play equipment something that not only you know, is fun for a kid, but it's challenging their brain and challenging their, their physical, you know, exertion. And, and, and it's becoming more fitness related in some ways. You see this with a lot of cable play. At the same time, on the adult side, equipment manufacturers are trying to get away from something that looks like you just pulled it out of a gym and plopped it, you know, outside and, and make it a little bit more maintenance friendly. And, and I'm not going to say more playable, um, but a little bit more creative so that you're, so that you're exercising your, your, your core and your body in, 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 a, in a number of different ways. Um, and that's why people are starting to call it, call them fitness playgrounds. Okay. Um, kind of in that same area of the park, um, I look at the, the Great Lawn. I think that's kind of a cool concept that seems like the maintenance of that would be relatively minimal. Um, 
is that do you anticipate that circle around it or the oval being used as kind of a walking and jogging trail also and if so you know what what do you anticipate the distance of that being is it a measurable quarter mile or something like that that great lawn ellipse um, would probably be closer to an eighth of a mile the way it's designed right but we do want, you know, the idea is there to have, is to have, yes, this, you know, this accessible walking path all around that um, so that, you know, folks can navigate from the pickleball to the destination play back to the parking lot or even the, the other, other portions of this park. Um, I'll also say that, you know, that great lawn in, in some ways is, is one of the only large expanses of turf we kind of see for for this portion of the park that would be you know you know maintained and, and cut and mowed on a regular basis. So we'd like to see the areas that aren't devoted to to you know programmed play be allowed to be a little bit more natural, um, to be able to grow up and and be a little bit more reminiscent of you know of the the Kansas grasslands you know we're all used to seeing just once we get outside the city limits. Um, certainly, you know, the, the driving range is going to be maintained and, and the grass around the entries and, and uh, you know, and, and the sides of, of these roads. But that great lawn would be, you know, would, would be a, a nice open area suitable for a lot of different typical park uses. I think in regards to the rest of the trail system and Aaron, you make a good point about I th we want to be able to capture distances and understand, have signage and so that people will know that, okay, I've made a, made a loop through the park. I've, I've walked a mile. I want to do another one, or I want to do a couple more. Or I want it to, I can do a, a cutoff here and say, grab a half mile or so. And so I think that conscious effort of, of being able to kind of through signage and and just development of this be able to say okay here i can i can if i walk every trail in the park i've walked two miles or two and a half miles of of space so that people get kind of because it is when you get out there and start walking it is a um, especially as you start cutting trails that maybe aren't just a straight path through there it is there's quite a bit of land out there to cover yeah and, and i yeah. think you know a lot of people don't necessarily want to do trail running or walking also. Um, and, and I do think having that in such a close proximity to, to the fitness playground and the, you know, pickleball courts and things like that, I think maybe some of the folks that are walking at the mall today might, might find an opportunity to come here instead in the summertime. Um, and then I, one other question I did have is in the, um, the far Southwest corner there, is, is that trail connecting with Ancaster, um, the, the end of the road there? Um, one of the concerns that I've had all along is the access for the neighborhood to be able to get to the park um, because there are no sidewalks on Indian Hills Road. And so if, if kids are gonna be walking to the park, I think it's important that we have that backside access there um, and, and it looks like there might be something, but um, I didn't hear anybody speak about it. So yes, that is what that is intended to be is is a neighborhood notion that there's a neighborhood access there, whether um, there we develop an easement through there, but um, connection to the neighborhoods um, is important as well as connection to there are sidewalks along 21st Street when 21st Street was was developed there. And so connection points um, at Kind of these these interstitial points that that connect from that sidewalk into the park as well so looking at and then as yourish future plans for yourish redevelopment um, kind of re-looking at how those sidewalks and amenities connect into the park there okay that's all i've got for now commission rip on yeah, uh, on that same uh, vein uh, with that access, uh, I talked to the planning, uh, or Bill Fyander with planning of the city and, and, and uh, uh, talked to him about making sure is that, is that uh, site uh, just to the west of this park is developed that, that uh, we main some kind of a right of way or an easement to, to connect to the, uh, the city sidewalks over there. So uh, hopefully we're covered there. Uh, I had a question just south of the 
pickleball courts. It looks like, I, I can't tell if those little brown things are trees or, or what those are right along. Yeah, right there. Those are, those are trees. Uh, one, yeah, we're, one thing we're trying to do with that access, you know, is, is, is create, you know, a, a really attractive entry into this park with kind of a median there dividing the, the egress and, and, and ingress lanes. Um, you know, trying to create a, a kind of a landscape border around, um, around the pickleball courts, same thing around, around that golf parking lot. There are some shade structures within the, the pickleball complex. So these red kind of dots that, that find their way through the middle of the park are some shade structures um, dedicated to that, that area of activity. Uh, I've had a number of emails from pickleball people and uh, some of them have said that, that 20 courts are what are needed for a, for a tournament. Is there a possibility of this plan to squeeze another four courts and maybe to the north uh, if that's actually uh, what's needed and this you know takes off and we need to add more courts? Is that a possibility to... Yeah, I think as this goes into design, I think we can fine tune. We chose 16 as kind of that, that balance between the, the top and the bottom. Um, I think as we move into design um, or as this project moves into design, there's if, if 20 is, is the programmed amount, um, this area um, with some shifting of other amenities can, can accommodate that. Uh, the other question I had is uh, uh, your driving range. Uh, is that going to present a problem with, uh, if they shoot like I do, they, they might be over there in the street. Uh, is that, uh... So there would be some, some screening through, through fencing, um, as well as uh, berms and, and trees and through here to help uh, kind of separate that from, uh, from the, this drive here. But yeah, there would be the incorporation of some, uh, some netting. netting system. Yeah. Okay. Um, this uh, the clubhouse you talked about it being kind of a community building as well um, do you have any visions of what that might look like would that be like a room people could rent for for different occasions yeah or? so that would be so it would serve from a from a golf standpoint it would it would serve the day-to-day -day use of golf as well as um, have space for uh, whether they had large tournaments out there um, space to gather in but then as a from a rental standpoint or a venue standpoint there it's it's conceived that that there is a portion of the building um, has a kind of a, a large indoor area that could be rented as a either a meeting venue or an event venue um, that has that kind of steps out into an outdoor uh, patio area um, uh, so that it's, it's an attractive venue um, that supports kind of activity in the park um, as well as as the kind of the rental space rental um, and just general venue space that exists in the parks and rec um, uh, parks and rec overview would this be an amenity too that could be like a clubhouse too as well for pickleball people uh, say you had a, a tournament or something going on and um, uh, I th we we had a, a fair amount of discussion about um, kind of the the um, sharing of obviously I think some some of that that venue space could be shared with a pickleball tournament but I think um, having this um, this uh, a shelter up here is probably going to be uh, better serving the the pickleball needs from what we heard um, they don't necessarily need a a large indoor clubhouse area but um, but having uh, this open air shelter down here um, with restrooms um, and ability to maybe plug in a PA system or something mm -hmm. um, that that would start to serve that. Um, I think the, the conversation was just that, that overlap, maybe some competing activities if you had kind of both those sport interests um, from a pickleball standpoint and a, a golf kind of, if you had a, say a tournament for both, um, going on at the same time, providing some separation between those functions. All right. Uh, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. Uh, do you see these ponds as being part of our storm drainage system for this park then? As, you know, for the runoff for these parking lots? And... 
impervious area. Yeah, so the goal would be to manage all of our, naturally manage all our stormwater um, on site, through the site as it leads into the golf course so that we know that we're introducing um, some pervious uh, or impervious surfaces to the park. Um, and so uh, just through stormwater requirements, stormwater management requirements, we would look to kind of naturally manage those uh, through the park and they might, um, you know, seasonally be um, kind of retain, retain more water in certain seasons than other times, but make them so that they look year round, they look like a, um, a natural amenity that's, that's approachable, that's safe to be around. Um, but then in the event of large storm activities, they're able to manage that stormwater through there so that we're also not inundating, um, say, areas of the trail or other kind of developed areas that, that aren't intended to be inundated with water. Uh, I might be getting a little ahead of design, but uh, have you thought about uh, the lighting of this park and what would, what, I mean, do the pickleballs, the, the, those courts probably would be lit, I would think, in some fashion, uh, uh, parking lots. Uh, what about the drive going through there? Would that be something we would light up or? So we would have a, we would have an appropriate um, level of lighting. Um, given the activity that's going on. Um, uh, so yes, lighting is, would be, would be considered throughout um, the park um, in an appropriate manner for kind of the level of activity. Um, yeah, you mentioned too in the Bark Park, you had how many different cells that you have there for, for that one? There are three? Three, yes. Okay. All right. They are very popular. Uh, I think that's all I have right now. Tim, Zach, and Brian, have you discussed the fiscal note that would be needed to accomplish all of that you have on this master plan? Uh, this looks far more than what $10 million that we had discussed um, almost a year ago, year and a half ago. Uh, yes, we have discussed that at, at great length, and you're and you're correct. The everything that's shown on this plan would exceed uh, would easily exceed ten million dollars. So we understand that moving forward, um, that anything that we do on this site will need to be phased in, and so that is actually some of the things that we're working on right now, and that we will uh, bring back to our advisory board at the end of this month and uh, sort of have that discussion there first. And then, uh, then we'll have that discussion with the, with the commission as well. But yes, you, you are correct. Everything on this plan would, would cost uh, quite a bit more than 10 million. With the master plan being developed, are you in a position where you're going to be seeking corporate sponsorships of different parts of the park? Well, I think that we, we, we would be uh, doing a disservice if we didn't try to find alternative ways to fund portions of this park. So yes, we, we, we hope that we'll be able to bond some money and do an initial, an initial phase. And then after that, I think we'll start looking at uh, all the other possibilities that could include some naming rights that could include grants. Um, so bake sales, uh, <laughs> whatever we can do to uh, to try to make this a reality, but we understand that it's gonna that it's gonna take some time. In the grand scheme of the Shawnee County Parks and Rec, where does this phased in approach lay when we talk about completion of some of the projects that we have underway with renovation of community centers, um, looking at like the Oakland Pool, which is very much neglected, um, finishing things like the Dornwood, uh, Ball Diamonds, uh, the Adventure Cove at Lake Shawnee, uh, the development of the North Shawnee County uh, Park, Community Park, where does this fall with those other projects? Well, that's a great question. And I think the, the answer is that we, we would be doing this obviously in addition with the, to those things. And, and I want to be clear that we're we don't, we understand that um, there are things to do all over this park system and there always will be. I mean, re regardless of 
of what we do on a daily basis, there's always going to be deferred maintenance. There's always going to be projects that we're working on across the city. Uh, we think that that there is a need for services in this area, that we don't provide many services here. Uh, we think the addition of a destination park would take off a little bit of the, would lessen some of the the strain that's put on the other two, Lake Shawnee and especially Gage Park. So I, I, I wanna make it clear that we, while we are excited about this project, we are in no way, shape or form forgetting about our responsibilities as they pertain to other locations across the city. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions before we take public comment? We do have two individuals signed up for public comment today. Um, the first is Aldana Coates. Ms. Coates. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, like you mentioned, my name is Eldana Coates, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of the pickleball courts at Family Park. I also want to thank uh, Shawnee County Parks and Recreation Department, the advisory board, uh, Brian and Zach and their teams and all the others that have designed a beautiful and functional park. Um, as was mentioned, there was a reduction of four courts um, from the first design and the plan submitted in the presentation today. And I would like for you to consider adding the four courts back into the design. Um, the additional four courts would be a big boost um, to everyday play. Um, According to Sports and Fitness Industry Association, pickleball grew 23% during 2016 and 2019. I do want to mention that players will continue to play at Hughes Park, which has almost reached its capacity. Even in a year when many players were not playing due to COVID restraints and we did not organize any events, there were days and evenings when all of the courts were full with people waiting to play. Topeka has fun pickleball events such as leagues, clinics, lessons for beginners, round robins, and we are adding junior events. This includes players from the surrounding area such as Lawrence, Emporia, and Holton to name a few. The more playing space available, we will have room to add more of these players each week. Family parks being developed as a destination park, and like Gage Park and Lake Shawnee, Pickleball 2 will draw visitors from other counties. So let's address the tournament play. I emailed each of you several spreadsheets with the following information, but this is a brief summary is on a, based on a four-day tournament with players, support staff, and spectac uh, spectators. For a tournament of 500 registered players, which is slightly above the capacity for 16 courts, the direct and indirect economic impact would be $260,067. For a tournament of 600 players, which is the capacity for 20 courts, the direct and indirect economic impact is 327619 So that's a difference of $67,550 per tournament. As you can see, that's a lot of money spent in Shawnee County. I'm excited for the new park and the possibility it creates. And I will tell you every time that I see this presentation, I get more and more excited about um, seeing this come to completion. And I just want to thank you for making the pickleball courts a priority in phase one of the new and beautiful family park. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coates. Our uh, second speaker on this item is Nancy Dutton. Nancy. Is Ms. Dutton there? Okay. Not seeing Ms. Dutton, but uh, do we have any other have public any other comment? Public comment. Let's 
Seeing none. Uh, Tim, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Do you have any final comments about where we go from here? Well, I would just, as I mentioned earlier, we will be presenting uh, for, for the third time to our Parks and Recreation Advisory Board at the end of this month. And then hopefully between now and then, um, we'll, we'll take any feedback that we get from this point forward and and uh, incorporate uh, some of that into the plan if we think it's necessary. And, and then my goal would be to come back to this board, uh, hopefully uh, the beginning of March. And uh, hopefully by that point, we'll be, we'll be ready to uh, possibly approve the, the, the master plan. So uh, again, I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, letting us give the presentation today and uh, Look forward to trying to wrap this project up. Well, you mean get started. <laughs> wrap the master plan up, I guess, is what I should say. And then, then we can discuss what we do from there. All right. Thank, thank you all. Final comments. Yeah, Zach, Brian, thanks for all your work. And uh, Tim and your staff, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Madam Clerk, our next item. Item three, consent agenda. Are there any questions regarding the consent agenda? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Motion to approve by Commissioner Mays. Second by Commissioner Ripon. Roll call vote, please. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Ripon? Yes. Show that it passes three to zero. Our next item. Item four, new business, A County Clerk number one, consider all voucher payments. Commissioners, we have two voucher reports today, the first of which totals $2,532,065.49. Under Bridge Project, uh, we've got Finney and Turnip Seed for $35,000. That's for the Southeast Barrington uh, Road culverts over over the tributary to Lynn Creek. Uh, we also, under sales tax, have a payment to McCown Gordon uh, for $1,033,659. That's for renovations to the Stormontvale Event Center. Um, a side note on that is that it brings the construction contract to 89.22% complete. Uh, the remaining balance of that contract is $5,215,919. That completes the first voucher report. The second voucher report uh, is uh, community-based programs with our CRF funds, uh, payment to Child Care Aware for $22,749.09. There's only one uh, remaining payment from those CRF funds. That'll be to the Greater Topeka Partnership after we get the final documentation from them. So uh, I would expect that uh, in the near future. So I don't have any questions about any of these. And um, if you don't, I will move for approval. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Mays for approval. Second by Commissioner Ripon. Roll call vote, please. Cook. Yes. Mays. Yes. Ripon. Yes. So that it passes three to zero. Our next item. Item A2, consider correction orders. I'll move for approval. Second. Second. So Commissioner Cook made the motion. Commissioner Ripon seconded. Roll call vote, please. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Ripon? Okay. So that passes three to zero. Our next item. Okay, I've got uh, three. Um, oops, it's not me. Stephanie, we're. Uh, I have got three. Um, economic development renewals, and they all are uh, items three, four, and five. They are all for the same company, Big Heart Pet Foods, um, uh, formerly known as uh, Del Monte Fine Foods. And the uh, number three is the uh, renewal of the 10th year exemption for uh, Big Heart Pet Brands. Item four is the renewal of the uh, economic development for year seven for the second project. And number five is the uh, approval of the uh, fifth year for their third project. And all of these have been reviewed by the counselor's office. Um, they have uh, met all the requirements, the resolution as the commission um, 
originally approved them and uh, we are just recommending that you, uh, they, they paid their fee, their renewal fee, and we just, I'm asking that you uh, approve these renewals. I'll move for approval of items A3, A4, and A5. Second. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Mays. Our roll call vote, please. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Ripon? Yes. So that it, it passes three to zero for items A3, A4, and A5. Our next item. Item B, planning. Uh, number one, public hearing and consider approval of resolution number 21-9 uh, for a conditional use permit to allow a 10,320 square foot gymnasium that ex exceeds the height and area limitations for an accessory building on a 37.77 acre property at 8300 Southwest 69th Street in Auburn Township. Randy, this is, uh, turn it over to you first. Thank you. I was going to make sure my, my video was up. Uh, I see this pop back on. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, commissioners. Randy Anderson, planning department. Uh, this is a conditional use permit for the applicant at the northeast corner of Auburn Road and Southwest 69th to, <clears throat> excuse me, to, uh, to build a gymnasium for his daughter and for the various teams and clubs that she may be associated with. Of course, when you build a when you build a gymnasium, you have to build it large enough to accommodate the activity, and uh, <clears throat> as a result, the other additional side issues pertaining to, pertaining to that are, are that the sidewall height is 24 feet instead of the 16 feet that's permitted by the zoning district. The building height is 37 feet to the top of the pit, uh, peak of the roof, as opposed to the 20 feet that's permitted by the by the zoning district, and the total building area. When you combine the proposed building and the existing building is 15,320 square feet, which exceeds by 6,000 feet or a little bit more 6,000 feet, the, the area of the home. Uh, in fairness to the applicant, if, uh, if you were building a, an agricultural building like a barn or some other large scale, scale building, all of this would be approved. There wouldn't be any issue with the, uh, with the, with the sidewall height, the building height or the area. Uh, so, at some point, at some point, if the building were to revert back to uh, agricultural purposes or something having to do with the residential use of the home, uh, he would, uh, you know, the use would be would be compliant at some point if that were to, if if, that, if it were to be repurposed for that for that use. Um, so I want to want to make sure you were aware of that. Um, <clears throat> this is the area that received notice. We had several people who spoke at the. Um, at, at the planning commission meeting, all of which were invited back to this, to this meeting um, by the IT staff. Mr. Clark lives, or he owns property at, at the southwest corner of the intersection. He was opposed to the application and filed the petition. Uh, Randy, Randy, just a moment. Your, your item is, did you want it on the screen? It's not on the screen here. It's not? No, it's not. I had it shared a minute ago. It must have clicked okay. off. It was up earlier, but it was. Now it is up. There you go, Randy. Okay. I'm not sure I got the. I'm not sure I got the slideshow. I'm gonna redo that. And now it's not. Yeah. There you are. So you got it now. We are looking at a slide that says property owners within 1,000 feet. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll go back to the beginning of this part of the presentation. Uh, Mr. Clark lives or owns property at this southwest corner of the intersection. He was opposed to the application. This property owner to the to the south southeast was in full support of the application, as was the property owner to the immediate east of the subject property. They were in both in support of it. This owner, uh, Mr. Stratton down here, he was in support of the application only subject to the conditions of approval that are in the resolution. Uh, we did receive an, a, a protest petition from Mr. Mr. Clark, but he clearly did not, uh, his area did not encompass 20% of the, uh, 
of the area being noticed. So uh, you, you don't have any additional uh, criteria you have to, you have in your building. This is a simple majority vote is all that's required. This is uh, this is the amended site plan that we, we received just in the last uh, in the last week. Uh, it shows you here's Auburn Road to the to the west to the left side of your screen and 69th Street to the bottom of the screen. You see the size of the house here and the proposed um, improvements are the cross hatched area to the back of the existing metal building. This building is about 5,000 square feet. And this building would be about 11,000 square feet, giving you the area of about 15 or 16,000 square feet total for the two improvements. There's also a big lake back here, and the, and the property that the, at the owner uh, owns right here is is there's 30 there's 37 plus acres to the north of this that you're not seeing in this picture, but this is the immediate area that's developed on the property. This this shot right here is showing you how the two buildings would be would work together. This is the proposed building uh, with the two basketball courts slash volleyball courts that could be used in, in a half court setting or full court, have a couple of games going on at the same time. If someone, someone needed to go to the restroom, they're, they're, they're posing a connection between the two buildings and the restroom is located down in this part of the building. I would assume that's a unisex uh, restroom facility down at the bottom here. And here's your parking lot. So they would be able to enter the building and park their cars out here. And uh, that's how this, that's how the property would, would function together, the two buildings. One of the things that the commission was definitely interested in recommending approval of this was the was the apparent elevation of the of the property from the roads. This first this first el uh, illustration is showing you Auburn Road on the far right of the picture and shows you the general lay of the land. And you see how it begins to slope as you, as you move to the, to the east in, in, in the direction of the floodplain. And then the, then the building is located down at the bottom of that slope. Reason why that matters to the, to the commissioners and it should matter to you also is because if, if I'm driving along Auburn Road, the, the lay of the land is gonna obstruct a significant portion of the building that's that way is down below the, the average grade of the property. Looking at the property from from 69th Street, looking back to the north, you see the you see the existing building here, and the proposed building. And on the left, you see how the slope is sloping down to the building. So you can you can you can trace with your eyes uh, a line coming across here and it looks like maybe the, at least the, the, the bottom one third of the building might be screened from Auburn from um, you know, by, the, by the lay of the land and the slope. So really, really the main visible part of the property is located you know, just south uh, on, on 69th Street where, you, where a person driving by would see the mass of the building. And of course, on the on the east of this, that's not pictured, is the adjoining property owner, and there's there's a a lot of a major woodlands that are located to the east, and the woodlands also behind behind this building on, on the on the owner's property to the north. And here you see it again, looking looking at it. Oh, we'll go back one. Here you see it again, looking at it uh, from this is the east elevation. So if, if I'm a, if I'm the owner to the east. Here's the, here's the building that exists in the proposed building. And again, you get a picture of the contour sloping down to this property, and then it slopes down further into the uh, joining property. We asked the owner uh, to prepare some kind of an elevation that showed what the building will look like in terms of colors and design, because that was an issue at the planning commission meeting and it was also in the staff recommendation. And what they've come, come back with is this image Again, if you look on the, to the left, you can see the you see the top of the slope, how it slopes to the north, go, coming back toward goes away to these trees, and then it slopes down to the building. So you see the trees screening it on that side, and you see the trees back behind it on the adjoining property, and this is what the building will look like. It is a metal building, um, but the but the colors do make it um, a lot more appealing than what was than what was indicated on the 
on the original image. And here's the here's the building again, looking at it from the front, and you see the you see the slope more more pronounced. How it, it would curve around the building, and there's a drop off down to the building. And you see the trees again that that screen the the property. Getting to the recommendation, uh, the staff recommended denial of the of the request because because of the, the area, the size, the mass of the building with the surroundings uh, that that would be significantly larger than nearly everything in, in the vicinity of this of this property, and uh, and the other the other point is that uh, it would appear since the building is being built. For the for the daughter of the applicant, it would be a short-term use. Uh, it would be assumed that, that that she would grow up and eventually go to college and maybe go to maybe get married, have her own life of her own, of her own. So at some point, the, the the building wouldn't be used by by the daughter, whether it's ten years or twenty years or fifteen, whatever the number is. At some point, it's going to be discontinued, and the question then becomes, what is the building repurposed as? Uh, if it was if it was repurposed as agricultural, we have no we have no issue because that's a permitted use in that district. It's RA one. Um, we're concerned that it, it, the building lends itself to other uses that maybe are, are not neighborhood compatible. The planning commission looked at the same factors and they recommended approval um, by a vote of five zero, I believe. Uh, they were they 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 felt that the slope of the site mitigated. The, that the slope, the distance of the building from the property lines and from the from the roads with the trees would mitigate the, the visual impact of the building, which you saw yourself uh, is probably the case. Uh, they felt the use would not be detrimental to the to the use or value of the surrounding properties, um, and that the applicant had agreed to all the conditions limiting the CUP to just the, this owner, and it wouldn't move forward in time to any future owners of the property. And and the fact that the property owners to the to the immediate south or such as southeast and to the east were in support of the request, so they'd have they'd have uh, more more skin in the game of something to lose if the, if this project was approved. So for, for all those reasons, they felt that the uh, that the golden criteria the golden factor criteria had been satisfied, and they recommended approval of the request. Uh, the uh, so. Getting into the conditions, I won't read. I won't read all of these. The applicant is is amenable to all of them. They've actually they've actually complied with several of these in the last week. They've updated their site plan to show the the, the, the parking with with minimal minimal fine gravel and prevent dust. The building elevations have some have some design elements that make it look a lot more like it belongs in a neighborhood than at a, at an airport. In, in, at a, as a hangar for an airplane. So those, those are positive changes they made. Uh, <clears throat> it would dedicate extra, extra right of way for, 60, for 69th Street to widen into a um, 40 foot half right of way. So those are all good things. It agreed to. Um, the, the big things going forward are the are conditions three, three, four, five. Uh, they they said there will be no games tournaments that all the practices and training for for there will be no games tournaments or practice or training for more than 20 children they're limiting the, the they're limiting the building use to 20 kids uh provided that they're supervised by an adult or a trainer and uh number four is that the use will be limited to the just the applicant ati revocable trust these other conditions are pretty much standard uh, conditions with lighting and, and signage. The hours of operation are 8, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. just for guests. The owner, the, 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 the owner's daughter and family can use it anytime they wish. Uh, there's no limitation on that, obviously. The building that's there now, the 5,000 square foot building doesn't have a permit. Uh, the original owner of the property, not this owner, uh, built the building without the permit. And we've also indicated we, that uh, that the use would comply with any state and local health orders that may be in effect at the time the building is being used. So uh, that's covering a lot of issues. But uh, I want you to understand what the commission thought and what the staff recommendation has been and continues to be you know, and the reasons for the two. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions after you've completed your public hearing. 
At this time, I would make a motion to open the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Show a motion to open public hearing by Commissioner Cook, second by Commissioner Ripon. Roll call vote. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Ripon? Yes. Okay. At this time, we'd like to hear from the proponents, those in favor of this proposal. And uh, I believe uh, we have first, uh, Mr. Is Mr. Kenny here? Uh, Commissioner Cook, this is Greg Schwert. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm actually speaking on behalf of the applicant and on half of Schwert Design Group. Great, thank you. So uh, commissioners, uh, thanks for the time this morning. Again, um, my name is Greg Schwert, uh, president of Schwert Design Group 2231 Southwest Wanamaker Road, representing the Canfields uh, for this particular project. Um, I don't know if I need to take a lot of your time going back through this. I think Randy has done an excellent job uh, of presenting where we started and some of their concerns and how we have gone about addressing those and ultimately ended up with a unanimous uh, decision in favor of this change uh, as we go forward. You know, again, I think some of the key points that he highlighted, again, is this is a personal gym, uh, you know, and just the, the fact that it's a gym requires certain heights and dimensions that, that have to be maintained in order to make it work. Also, again, we think that, uh, you know, the site itself, um, although the gym itself is on approximately 37, 38 acres that the owner has, they also own an additional 40 acres north of this property. So uh, we're actually on 80 acres of land, uh, even though it, it is platted into two separate lots. Uh, we do have the woodlands to the east, the woodlands to the north. And as uh, Randy pointed out uh, it, I think, and, and requested, um, the diagram, uh, and it was at a small scale, but there is roughly 40 feet or almost four stories of fall from Auburn Road to the, to the gym itself. So uh, one, the fact that it's so far off the road and two, the fact that it sits so low below the road, uh, we maintain that it would be almost inobservable or unnoticed as someone was passing by. So, um, you know, I, I think that all the other conditions uh, the owner has agreed to. Um, and so I am, I'm open to any uh, questions that you might have regarding uh, this particular case. Any questions for Mr. Schwartz regarding this project? Here, if I may. Uh, Greg, what's the floor in this building? Is it just gonna be a concrete floor? Yes, it'll be a concrete floor. Um, the existing metal building also is concrete and um, again, it was not constructed by the current owner. It was constructed uh, in non-compliance, but um, it does was roughed in for toilet facilities is the only reason we're adjoining it. Uh, there is a septic system in place and uh, we've been working with the health department to make certain that it is uh, um, it, I mean, in size, but yes, it's, this is a concrete floor on a slab on grade. They're not planning on putting in any wood courts or artificial turf or anything like that. It's just concrete. Actually, I, I think the intent is to put a wood floor commissioner on top of the concrete slab. All right. Okay. I have no other questions. Uh, oh, well, I do have one. Uh, a person could screen from Auburn Road with some trees as well. It'd be fairly easy to do, I would think. That, that is correct. And, you know, we talked about that from uh, 69th Street, potentially. Uh, but yeah, that would be uh, an easy, easy thing to do. That's absolutely cor correct. Any other questions for Greg Schwart? Greg, just a question. If the owner was to sell and uh, a new owner was to take over and they did not want to have a gymnasium, what kinds of use could this facility have? Well, I, I think according to Randy, I think it could be reverted back to an agricultural use. Uh, the, the biggest concern commissioner when we uh, went through the staff review and through the planning commission was that it would be reverted back to a commercial use. 
um, you know, our, our contention, our argument was, is that one, you know, we can't control what someone else does in the future and to hold us accountable for that seemed that it was inappropriate. More importantly though, in order to change the use, they would have to come back through the entire process of an, a new conditional use for something else that either could be accepted um, or rejected at that point in time. So I think, uh, and Randy may have to clarify this, but I would think that an agricultural use would be the only use that would be acceptable under the current conditions. Uh, Any other questions, Commissioner Ripon? Yes, uh, Randy, you said if, if this building was no longer used as a gym it could, and it was an agricultural building, would an agricultural building fit all the requirements as far as the height if, if it was up, say, a barn? With oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's why I admit, that's, that was the point I made at the beginning of my presentation. What if I you have an ag building, there's no limitations on the, on the sidewall height, the building height, the, the materials of the building. Uh, as long as it was used for those purposes, uh, it would be completely compliant. Even okay. the even the area even the area would not be out of compliance because because there is no limit on the area of buildings used for agricultural purposes. Okay, the RA district. All right, thank you. I have no other questions. The only other question I have, Randy, is. If at some point in the future the owner wished to um, have a basketball training camp or a volleyball tournament there, then it would change the conditional use permit, and they would need to have a different application. Correct? That's correct. It'd be a, it'd be a brand new CUP for that for, the, for that particular use. But it would not be a violation for them to invite friends or family or uh, people from the community at no cost to be able to use the gym for whatever purpose. That's correct. It would only change if it becomes a commercial endeavor. Correct. <clears throat> Are there any other questions of the applicant or any other persons wanting to speak in favor of the applicant? Okay. Seeing none. Are there any persons wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Okay. Hearing none. Um, Greg, is there any final comment that you wish to leave us with? Uh, Commissioner Cook, no, I think that, again, uh, we're just here on behalf of the applicant. I think that, again, uh, as Randy stated, it is definitely the, the Canfield's intent to use this as a personal gym. Uh, there's no intent of running camps uh, or anything else uh, at this time. And I think, you know, one clarification that we had with the planning commission that somehow there was a concern that this was going to be a campground. Um, and that was clarified that uh, we were not bringing in um, trailers and campers and things like that, uh, if that may have come up. So no, I would uh, stand here to, again, just ask that, uh, ask for your consideration and approval of this um, application. Okay. All right, thank you. At this time, I would close the make a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Commissioner Cook to close the public hearing, seconded by Commissioner Mays. Roll call vote, please. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Ripon? Yes. Show that it passes three to zero. Um, next, uh, before we take vote on the resolution, I'm going to call upon a, either Jim Crowell or a member of the counselor's office regarding our factors to consider specifically the golden factors. Good morning, commissioners. Jim Crowell, Shawnee County Counselor. Yes, um, we often mention it when we have these types of issues, but um, we are considering a conditional use permit. And when we speak about the golden factors, there was a, a Kansas Supreme Court case Golden versus the city of Overland Park. It's a 1978 case. And in that case, the Kansas Supreme Court said uh, that courts, when they review one of these decisions, they're gonna look and determine whether the decision was reasonable. 
And in their mind, the decision would be reasonable if the body uh, considering the issue uh, considered one, the character of the neighborhood, two, the zoning uses of nearby properties, three, the suitability of the property for the uses to which it is restricted, four, the extent to which the change will detrimentally affect nearby property, five, the length of time the property has been vacant as, as zoned, if that was the appropriate situation, uh, Next factor, the gain to the public health, safety, and welfare by the possible diminution in value of the developer's property as compared to the hardship imposed on the individual landowners. Now, as you'll see as I'm reading these, some apply in a certain situation, some don't. Uh, the next one, the recommendation of a permanent or professional planning staff. And the last one is the conformance of the requested change to the city or county's uh, comprehensive plan. If you look to in your packet, and when we receive one of these, we receive a pack with multiple documents. Um, there are two different documents titled zoning report. Um, if you go to the one that says zoning report, Shawnee County Planning Department, dated January 11th, 2021, when you get down to about halfway into that document, you will see that the planning staff has started listing out these golden factors and giving you, giving you information related to that. So you see character of the neighborhood and they note that the surrounding area is residential, agricultural and undeveloped. And then you start seeing the additional classifications. Basically that's your planning staff um, giving you their view of the golden factors and the information related to this request that are related to those factors. So that is what you need to consider when considering whether to approve this request today. And I'll be happy to try to answer any additional questions you might have. Questions for the counselor. Here, I have one question. Sure. Uh, in the event that the Canfield sell this property, would the next property owner have to get approval to use this building in the same manner, or would those rights just carry over to the next owner? My understanding of, Randy, you want to take a stab at that first as to what yeah. the intent of the restrictions were? The intent of the restriction was the, the, the commission the commission didn't have any doubt about the about the the immediate purpose of the building that the daughter would, would be using the building for her family's purposes and for her clubs and teams uh it's, but they but they were concerned about potential long term uh, a second a second user or a third user that's why they limited to just this user uh if they were if, if someone wanted to come in and use the building for the exact same purpose that you might have be approving it for today they'd have to get a new cup in other words, when this owner sells the property or his daughter stops using the building for those purposes, the CUP at some point is going to sunset. Uh, so if I wanted to come in after them and use it for the exact same purpose, I mean, I'm back to square zero, giving you the, pre the same presentation that, uh, that the Canfields have done today and asking for your approval. However, if I want to use the, if I want to repurpose the building for agricultural purposes, that is perfectly legal, requires no conditional use permit or any other action by by the staff or by by the by the board of county commissioners okay uh that was just for agricultural but not for anything commercial say a guy wanted to i don't know paint cars in there that would be a different type of use and well that's 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 a fine line uh th that's part of the concern because i mean if i'm an owner of, of that house I, i paid a good price for the property and I may I may have six or seven cars out that I want to uh, you know rehabil rehabilitate. You know I, I'm out there I'm I'm doing my cars as my hobby. Uh, that's a fine line between what is what is commercial and what is residential purpose. I think if I was doing it for my own cars, I'd I'd probably be okay. Uh, but uh, 
that, that's the all right. There's the question. When you have a building of that size, there's a lot of things that could happen in the building. Sure. Uh, it's just the nature of a big building, especially a nice warm one. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, you know, people people do what they do. My understanding, Commissioner, of the restriction as written is if the property is sold, it certainly would pro prohibit any future commercial use of the property and the new owner would have to come in and seek a new conditional use application to, to use it for a commercial use. Thank you. That's all I have. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. <clears throat> I think, Commissioner Mace. I think for me, the most important thing with this is the fact that if, if it were an agricultural building, it would be approved without any consideration. Um, and, and so, I, I mean, to me, that means if he were to fill this with hogs, that it wouldn't, wouldn't be a problem. Um, but I can tell you that would be more problematic. Um, I, I know of several other residences uh, in Topeka that have similar setups um, with a large outbuilding. Um, to my knowledge, none of them have ever really been a problem for the neighbors. Um, and so I, I'm, I have no problem approving this today. The only uh, comment that I might have, and this is just um, more just notation for Commissioner Ripon and Commissioner Mays, we have had an issue that arose in the um, last several years where a private um, gymnasium and uh, out area uh, was going to be converted into a commercial gymnasium and um, park area. And the neighborhood uh, was uh, not in favor of that and that was ultimately denied. And um, at that time, there was discussion about if they were to do this in a non-commercial endeavor, it would be allowed, but when it becomes a commercial endeavor, it was denied. And so just again, notating that at this point, if we allow this to proceed forward, this would be allowed in a non-commercial endeavor as um, detailed with the planning commissioner or planning director, Mr. Anderson. So. Just as a note that we have had this issue that has come up in the past, but um, Commissioner Mays, I agree with you that, you know, this is an issue that you know, if it was any other agricultural building, it would fe meet with no opposition. Commissioner Ripon, anything? No, I don't have any further questions. I, I too, I'm, I'm not opposed to this project. I, I don't see where it, uh, it uh, adversely affects anybody around there and like Commissioner May said, it could be a hog farm and, and there's, you wouldn't even need a permit. Uh, so anyway. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Commissioner Rippon, second by Commissioner Mays. Roll call vote, please. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Rippon? Yes. So that it passes three to zero. Uh, Jim, is Crowell, is there anything additional you need notated from us? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item, please. Thank I'm you, just... Commissioners. Thank Greg you. Schwartz. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Item C, Court Administration Number One. Consider authorization and execution of Contract C49-2021 with Phoenix Home Care and Hospice to provide public entrance health screening services to the courthouse at a weekly cost of $1,120 with funding from the health department and if necessary contingency funds and approval to waive the purchasing policy. Good morning, commissioners. Lee Welch, Shawnee County Court Administrator. And um, this has been a joint effort between the county counselor's office, myself, um, as representative of, of the courts, um, Betty Greiner and also um, Craig Barnes of the Health Department. Um, due to the continuing and ongoing COVID concerns, um, and the court, the court has been um, actively um, seeking a health screener for the public entrance to the building. Um, we routinely have 
um, persons who are either symptomatic or even COVID positive in the courts. Um, this is happening at least once a week, if not more frequently. Um, so in an effort to um, enforce and, and protect the health and safety of not only um, those who work in the county courthouse, but also um, the public, um, we would like to um, have this request approved. Um, I know that Jim Crowell has reached out to a number of companies for um, contract services. Um, two that he's um, gotten the most input from were both in Kansas City. One of the two is actually owned by someone from here in Topeka, which is the one that um, we're looking at. Um, initially, the thought was that the cost would be somewhere around $7,500 a month, and it ended up um, being $1,120 per week, which we thought was, was a really um, much better number, obviously, as opposed to the $7,500. Um, when we first started looking at this, the goal was to hire a company who could perform this service on an intermittent basis or, or a temporary basis for, say, a month or so while the county could fill a couple of intermittent uh, positions to cover this um, task. What we figured in speaking with Betty Greiner is that it's not much more expensive to maintain the contract with um, the Phoenix Home Care and Hospice over um, simply using intermittent Shawnee County staff. Um, one of the benefits aside from, uh, from a professional person um, performing these screening tasks is that if um, someone is not performing their duties, someone calls in sick at the last minute, it's the responsibility of, of Phoenix Home Care and Hospice to find a replacement for that day, not left to um, the court or Shawnee County to come up with a, a suitable re a replacement. Um, the court's commitment or contribution to this has been that we will serve as the point person for Phoenix Home Care or whomever is contracted. Um, we'll work with them as far as scheduling, um, any issues or concerns that arise. Likewise, if, if the commission um, wishes to go with an intermittent employee, uh, we've committed to also supervising those staff persons as well as maintaining and managing the schedule for those people. Um, the funding source for this as, as proposed would be through grant funds um, through the County Health Department. If we're not successful in that endeavor, um, I, Jim and I have worked with Betty Greiner and the plan is to use contingency funds. Um, initially what we're looking at is a six month period and hopefully by the end of six months, um, vaccinations in the community are um, getting up to speed and, and we have a, a good sense of immunity, if you will. Um, if, it, if we feel that it needs to go beyond six months, we are, um, I will come back to the commission and, and revisit the issue at that time. Do, is there any questions or um, concerns that I can address? Any questions for the court administrator, Ms. Welch? Uh, Commissioner Ripon. Yes. Uh, do we have to sign like a six month contract? Could it be a shorter, it could be month by month or? There's, there really, there isn't a con, what we've, what Jim has signed or prepared is a, um, simply a, a contract, if you will, for paid services. Um, the termination of agreed services simply needs a two week notice. And we have been advised by uh, Phoenix Home Care and Hospice that it will take them about two weeks to have someone lined up um, to step up to this position. And what will this person do? Will they just be taking a temperature? Do they ask them seven questions or what's the, what are you if, looking for? If you'll permit me to read this, um, 
they'll do temperatures, they'll um, do specific questioning as to if the uh, visitor has um, been exposed to someone with, co with COVID in the past 14 days, if they personally have any signs or symptoms of COVID in the past week, if they've traveled outside the United States in the past 14 days, and or if they have been diagnosed or tested positive for COVID within the past 14 days. That's the, the standard um, set of questions that uh, Phoenix uses. And I believe um, Jim can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's um, a pretty standard screening process for uh, most agencies. Correct. This is Jim Crow, Shawnee County Counselor. And uh, to specifically answer your question, it's not for a specific term. It's an open-ended contract that can be terminated uh, upon two weeks notice. Currently, we're not doing anything at the, at the, at the gate right now. The, the, number, the six month period is something that, that uh, Betty and I were discussing this morning that if this falls back on contingency funds, she wanted a specific um, period that that she knew that she needed to um, have commitment for funding, um, whether she suggested whether it was six months or nine months. And um, I'm hopeful that within six months, we can hopefully have a handle on COVID in our community. Commissioner Mays. Yeah, hey, Jim, I, I'm not seeing that um, two week notice clause in here. All I'm seeing is item number three, the termination due to lack of funding where it says um, we have to notify 30 days prior to the end of our fiscal year and, and then we'd have to pay through the end of the fiscal year. So, I Mr. Mean, Mays, it's on the, the first page. It said the top of the page says client liability form for privately paid services. And it's just above, it's the very last line on that document right above the signature of the client. All right, thank you, I see that now. You're welcome. Any other questions? There a motion. I'll move to approve, is there a second? I'll second. Motion to approve by Commissioner Cook, second by Commissioner Mays. Our roll call vote, please. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Rip on? Yes. Show that it passes three to zero. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We appreciate it. Our next item. Item five, administrative communications. Stephanie? <laughs> Good morning, Commissioner Stephanie Kuhlman with the Shawnee County Commission Office. Today is February 1st, which kicks off Project Topeka Month. I'm going to share my screen. So Project Topeka Food Drive is a volunteer organization, which means 100% of your donation is used to feed the hungry in Topeka and Shawnee County. To learn more about it, you can go to projecttopeka.org. Uh, next, I'm going to show a short video produced by Project Topeka uh, regarding their efforts in Topeka schools. Before we had fun food. Sorry. Fridays. Only about 20 students received any type of food assistance on the weekends. And that was very difficult for us because we had to pick and choose which students uh, would receive those snacks. To know that a child is hungry, to have a child say that they're hungry, they can't learn if they're hungry. My school is full of such amazing kids that have incredible potential. And so to have the community support them in a way that you know, for somebody to step in and say, hey, we saw you had a need and we would like to fulfill that need for your students. You can't measure that impact. When you pour into kids, they are our future. They're the future of Topeka. They're the future of 
our state and our world, and they are going to change things. Starting right here, we're changing their futures. Program started because we recognize the need in the community that kids are going hungry on the weekend and not being able to perform well in school. There's a stigma attached to food assistance to kids who were receiving extra food, and we wanted to help eliminate that stigma by providing every kid with a bag of food to take home with them for the weekend. Before we can ever address students' learning needs, that uh, we have to address their basic needs. So having Fun Food Fridays and having that opportunity for them to extend that kind of care into the weekend to help meet their needs is something that you just can't put a price on. I would like to say that the impact that has been made through the Fun Food Friday program is immeasurable. Because of the partnership that has been created here, uh, we've seen an increase in engagement with our students as well as the academic performance of our students. And this way we know that they've got a resource that they can turn to on the weekend. It's not just a one-time thing. It's really called Fun Food Fridays because it does make Fridays a little extra special. The support we need is from the community. We need volunteers. We also need funding for the program. It's expensive to provide food to 100% of the kids at each school. Currently, we're going to be providing around 700 bags a week to the kids. This is going to tally over 200,000 food items over the course of a school year. Personally, I'd like to see this program rolled out to all the schools that have a need that is not currently being met. It's the time, money, effort that's going to be required to do it. The kids and the staff and myself work hard every day for their success in so many areas. And to have community support in that, we'll take it. So throughout the month of February, Shawnee County employees will bark will be participating in some fundraisers. And this Friday, February 5th, I will be selling donuts here in the courthouse basement from 7.30 until they're sold out. Department of Corrections has been selling cinnamon rolls every month for the last several months. And February 5th, again, Friday, is the last month to pick up your gigantic cinnamon rolls. Wednesday, February 10th, the appraiser's office will be selling pizza and pop from 1130 until round one or until they sell out in the North Annex conference room on the first floor. Friday, February 12th, Audit Finance, HR, and Register of Deeds will be having a bake sale in the courthouse basement uh, starting around 7.30 until they're sold out. The Health Department will be hosting a, a food drive in several of their buildings, the Shawnee County North Annex, J.P. Lewis, and the Vansicle Thorn Building. If you would like to make any uh, monetary donations, you can contact Jennifer Zimmerman. DOC, Department of Corrections, is also hosting a burrito meal deal and a fish sandwich deal on Friday, February 19th, starting at around 10 a.m. One of our big fundraisers, uh, will be the online auction. The auction will be live starting on February 22nd and end at noon on February 25th. This is open to county employees as well as courts employees. So a, an email will be going out with all the details um, and the website that you can post your photo and description of the item that you are donating. So that is all I have regarding our fundraising month. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for heading that up. Thank you. And all the good that it does. Thank you. Other administrative communications this morning?
I'll jump in here. Um, Tim Laurent, Shawnee County Parks and Recreation Department. I just wanted to give a quick update on the progress uh, that, that we've made towards the Cossover restroom renovation project. So if you remember, we were at the commission earlier this year and uh, we were given permission to begin negotiations with Shirley Construction on the project, which we have done. Uh, we did meet with Shirley on site, discuss the project. They're aware of our particular situation as it pertains to the grant. They believe that um, they have uh, more than this in the contract, but they believe they could complete the project as early as 60 days once given the go ahead, uh, maximum of 90 days. So as it stands right now, we are, we're finalizing the contract. We'll bring that up to the commission soon. And unfortunately, we're still waiting to hear word on our grant. We uh, are in constant communication with Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism who are administrating the grant, but they've yet to hear anything from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We have heard through other agencies in the state um, that there, are, there is some movement. None of, none of the uh, grants across the state have been awarded yet but some of the agencies have been told that, they're, that it looks very promising as far as the amount of funds that are being made available. So we still feel confident that we'll receive the grant when that time comes, but unfortunately we know that we're up against a, um, a little bit of a time constraint if, you, uh, if we wanna to try to get it done before we get into the thick of the tennis season. So uh, with that, uh, just wanted to give you that update. I, I know Bob Keishan is here and wants to speak as well, but before I turn it over to Bob, if any of you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions for Tim? Any questions for Tim? Bob? Thank you. Just briefly, um, the Cossover building and restrooms were built in 1985 when we had nine tennis courts. Now we have 18. Uh, I've listened to the family park presentations, both at the advisory committee level and before this commission. And there's discussion of making a destination park. Cossover is already a destination tennis center, not only for this area, for a five state area. We have six USTA five state either tournaments or sectional events coming. One of them is the second time we've held it. We had 343 players as well as coaches and others come for that event. We'll have the tournaments this year, but I'm looking to the future uh, come April 22nd, April following weekend, we have large events scheduled at Cossover and we would like to see this go forward. And I know the commission is, and Tim is waiting on this grant, which may come. It was scheduled for August, it was scheduled for December, it was scheduled for January. And when I looked at the website, they don't even have a meeting scheduled to discuss giving these grants out. I called a, Sherry Riffey, who said there will be a meeting February 24th to discuss the grants. And I presume that if it's favorable, it might be after that. I don't know how this stands. Tim probably has a better feel for it, but I know that in the previous years, they said indoor facilities such as enclosed shelters are not eligible for these funds. There might be an exception for renovation, but I would like to see and would request that the commission consider going forward with this project because even Tim, before the advisory committee was less optimistic and said, I'm beginning to worry that we won't get the grant. Um, I'm fairly certain that if we go forward with the restrooms that we have when we have 300 players or when we have 90 girls for girls state that it will be difficult to have these events in the future and I know that we're talking about a six-figure grant here 
I've pointed out that I'm looking to the future, Edmond, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Wichita are building multi-million dollar transformations. And we're asking for several hundred thousand to get this project completed. Come April, uh, I will be at two years on discussions of this project without anything being done, even during COVID periods when it's shut down, even during winter periods when there's nothing going on. And that's our request that we begin to actually consider moving forward on our own. Thank you for your time. Be glad to answer any questions. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Keegan or Mr. Tim Laurent, the director for regarding this crossover or when we might have this item before us? Tim, do you have a timeline for when you might bring this back to the commission? The contract is, uh, if, it's, if it's not in the hands of Shirley by now, it should be this week. And so once we get the signed uh, contract back from them, then we will, uh, well, actually, we'll, I think we're close enough now, we'll go ahead and schedule and try to get on an upcoming agenda. But I think we'll be to the commission. My goal would be within the next two weeks to approve the contract. Okay. Thank you. I would like to clarify just briefly that I know Bob, mentioned that I made a comment in the advisory board meeting that I didn't think we'd get the grant. I think what I said uh, was that I wasn't sure we'd get the grant in time to get it done for, for the tennis season. And, and um, I think I still feel that way. I mean, there, there is a chance. And um, so. Thank you. Kurt. Yes, Commissioners, uh, Kurt House, Director of Public Works. I just wanted to remind everyone, including the public, that Northwest Wilson Road, a one mile segment between uh, Northwest uh, 86th and Northwest 94th will be closed beginning today for a bridge replacement project. Um, anticipated completion uh, would be uh, June 4th of this year. Thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioner Mays, anything to update the commission on? No, nothing from me today. Commissioner Rippon. Nothing from me. Okay. And uh, I don't have anything either. Madam Beck, Madam Clerk, our next item, please. Item six, executive session. Uh, there is a need to go into executive session today. Uh, this will be for a period not to exceed 15 minutes, and it will be for the following reason. One, for the preliminary discussion of the acquisition of real property for 15 minutes. Two, for consultation with the attorney for the body, uh, public body or agency, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship on the same issue. Um, action could follow the executive session, and this is a motion to go into executive session. Second. Or second. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Cook, second by Commissioner Ripon. Our roll call vote. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Ripon? Yes. Okay. We are going into executive session. It is 11.07. Um, so we will show starting at 11.08.
we're all done. I'm jumping back down with you because my link disappeared. So we're done with the executive session. Me and Betty. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Beck, are you there? I am back. I'm sorry okay. I had to swear at oh. people. All right. We are back from executive session. We have, um, or will be taking motion or a action. Uh, this is a motion made by Commissioner Cook for the county councilor to extend an offer for the purchase of real property, including the placement of 25,000 as earnest money for the purpose of purchase of real property. The county councilor is being authorized to uh, make contact with an architect for review of the property, as well as make arrangements for building inspections to be completed within 45 days. The county councilor will be preparing a contract that the county commission will be taking action on at a later time. And that is a motion made by Commissioner Cook. Second. So motion made by Commissioner Cook, second by Commissioner Mays. Our roll call vote. Cook? Yes. Mays? Yes. Ripon? Ripon was a yes. He chose muted, but I saw his lips moving. <laughs> uh, yes. Just, just nod is fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry about that. It is approved and passes three to zero. We do not have any further action from our executive session, so we are adjourned. Thank you.